it has already been observed above that the science of kinship with the Western languages extend in part to the Slavonic and Baltic tongues. But philologists have been especially struck by the fact that these languages have in common a great number of words which are lacking in Indo-Iranian, Armenian and Greek. They therefore infer that all Northwestern Europe had a vocabulary of its own, as opposed to the Mediterranean vocabulary. These represent two areas of civilization, or two areas of intercourse. It is needless to demonstrate that one of them was the Mediterranean basin. The belt in which the Northwestern vocabularies are supposed to have been used was the scene of cultural events of a general nature which are revealed by prehistoric archaeology. The spread of the rite of incineration in the Bronze Age. The diffusion of the same time of pottery of the Lausitz type and the amber trade. All these mean intercourse within a given belt, the climate of which, moreover, is much the same throughout, suits the same crops and bears the same flora. Communications of this kind are calculated to encourage interchange amongst languages. Some words correspond to the features of civilization which are found in the two different parts of the belt, while others are picked up by men going about in it. We may suppose that there was a lingua franca for Northwestern Europe and there was one for Mediterranean. The Italic languages extend their domain southwards and Celtic languages southwestwards of the Great Plain of Northern Europe, to which the Northwestern vocabulary belonged, but they had their share in it. In its Mediterranean evolution, Italic grew close to Greek, but many similarities prove that it is connected to the language of the North. So too, Celtic contains many words which have equivalents in the Sylvanic languages on the one hand and in the Baltic tongues. Lithuanian, Thetic and Old Prussian. On the other, it is an interesting fact that both Italic and Celtic preserve as records of their origin their share of the northern vocabulary. Long lists have been drawn up from which we shall draw with due caution. Of the words contained therein, some are shared only by Celtic and the languages mentioned. The question of borrowing has been raised as in the case of Germanic and the rest appear also in Germanic and in Latin. All these languages had the same word for the sea. They pronounced it differently. Celtic, with an O, Maori. Irish, Muir. Britain, Mar. Latin, with an A, Mer. Germanic and Balthasavonic, with an A, and Old Icelandic, Mar. Modern German, Muir. Slavonic, Muir, and Lithuanian, Malus. Some of the words in which the languages agree refer to social life, as for the word for people, which appears in the following forms. Irish, Tua. Oscan, Tuto. Gothic, Tuda. Lithuanian, Tata. A root, Valdla, meaning power or greatness, territorial domain, territory, comes into Latin, Valir. Modern German, Valtan, and Slavonic, Bladi, and is represented in Celtic by Irish, Flia, or Dominion, Territory, and Welsh, Blad. Whence comes the uh, Gweldic Prince? Most common words deal with agriculture, plants, and animals. Old Slavonic, Sruna, and Lithuanian, Serenus, correspond to Latin, Granum. Irish, Gran, Scottish, Carn, and English, Corn. Russian, Prosino, or rye meal, correspond to the Gothic adjective barsons of barley, Latin farina, and Welsh barra, bread. And the word for apple has been discussed um, before. The pig, Latin porcus, was called orc in Irish, fara in Old High German, pras in Lithuanian, and pras in Old Slavonic. Latin feba, or bean, corresponds to Old Prussian babo. Naturally, Celtic and Germanic represent more similarities to the Baltic dialects shared with them alone than Italic does. The resemblance in Latin are survivals. Those in Germanic have been kept up by the relations of the two peoples as neighbours, and this is also a great extent true of Celtic. Baltic and the North Sea united the peoples, which dwelt in the shores just as the Mediterranean did. 
It is possible too that in the centre of Europe the Celts had once been neighbours of the earliest Slavs as one of the Germans. The following words are found only in the Celts, Germans and Slavs. There is a plant name, variously used for the yew and the willow. Welsh Old High German, Eva, Ape, Old Slavonic, Yiva, and the word for metal, lead, Louis, in Irish, La, in Old High German, is found in Russian in the form of Ludo, meaning tin. The Baltic Slavonic languages have more likeness to Celtic than to Germanic. This may be due to the loss of words by Germanic. But the resemblances may also be the special and typical. Some of them consist of terms of abstract or general meaning relative to qualities, to manners of being and bear witness to a common past, perhaps a remote one. Thus, Irish cutlet, or um, in general, cutlta, or colour, sleep to sleep, is a compounded verb with a Lithuanian possess in a simple form of tulity, or to be quiet. Irish gil, or wort, power, is wort, is found in Lithuanian Galiti and old uh, Slavonic Gwilmuvu and other names of concrete things or national or social notions. For example, Irish Mariach, Breach, Welsh Breach, Gaulish Brace or Malt correspond to Russian Braga, which is the same meaning. Irish Slug or Troop corresponds to Slavonic Sluga or Servant and Lithuanian. Slaginti. The philologist uh, Mr. Shakmatov has drawn up a long list of words of the common Slavonic tongue, which he holds have been taken from Celtic, but is open to criticism. We must, however, suppose that some of the similarities between Celtic and Baltic Slavonic are due to the latter language borrowing words through Germanic or over the head of Germanic. Even the Finnish tongues borrow some of the words from Celtic, but here there is no question of common past. We may only note these borrowings because they have an idea of the distance in which Celtic civilization shed its influence. Some of the political and legal terms which Germanic took from Celtic were passed on the old Slavonic and Finnish. Such are the word for debt, Old Irish Tlegit, to which Slavonic and Tlugu corresponds. True Gothic Dulgs, the word for inheritance, Arab in Finnish. The word for wort, Berta, in Finnish. The word for kingdom, Ricky, in Finnish. The last two words were borrowed fairly late. The word for office, Amati, is in Finnish. In the previous words is probably the intermediate Germanic form that was borrowed. Celtic influence was only transmitted. The connection might be quite close, but it might be very distant. As an instance of direct borrowing, on the other hand, we have the Finnish Tarvus, and Celtic tar or bull. Here there is no intermediate Germanic word. These facts show how Celtic civilization circulated and expanded in the cultural area of the Northwest. Celtic came into contact with other languages than Germanic, Slavonic, and Italic. When the Latins and Umbrians went down into Italy, they left the Celts uncovered on the east. In that quarter, various Indo European languages were spoken and it would be interesting to know in order to have a complete notion of the affinities of Celtic. These were the Illyrian, Thracian, Dacian, and Getic. The Illyrians had their historical relations with the Greeks, and so did the Dacians, but how far did they go back? There were certainly religious resemblance between the Thracians and the Greeks, which may have come down from a very ancient cultural relations. The various languages did not vanish without leaving a trace. Something in their vocabularies remains in that of the Slavonic tongues, Romanian, Albanian, and Greek. This last language is highly complex. It has inherited something from the languages which were spoken in, on Greek soil, sorry, on Greek soil before the Hellens, properly so called, arrived there. And among these, there were Indo European tongues which we cannot classify. It also picked up many words from neighbouring dialects. The scholars of Greece were interested in the foreign elements in their speech and faithfully collected them in the dictionaries. Greek had a certain number of words in common with Celtic, either with Celtic alone or with it and other of the languages which we have been considering. Usually they are rare words, or to be more accurate, the most striking cases are rare words, that is, foreign words. Thus Greek, which is 
only distantly related to Celtic, has preserved words which bear witness to languages which were much closer to it. For example, the name Akros contains the word Kapais, which does not mean cry, but rock, like Welsh Craig. The word may be like Sicil or Ligurian, now Celtic, like Sicilian. Greek absorbs from the Ligurian vocabulary. There were all two reciprocal borrowings for which Greek travellers and colonists were responsible. Greek Ilix is Gaulish Pren or Irish Crown. Old Irish Machen or Root and Gaelic Macon Carrot recall Greek Poppy, as do Old Slavonic Maku and modern German Mon. We got to preserve some relics of the ancient tongues of Asia Minor, some of which, such as the Phrygian tongues of Asia Minor, some of which, as Phrygian, which is former Thracian, belong to a group of European languages enumerated above, while the others are at least part Indo European, such as Hittite. Here we can glean a few similarities to Celtic. Another descendant of these tongues is Armenian, which is difficult to place exactly in the body of Indo European languages. It seems to be more distant from from the Celtic group than Greek. The further apart dialects lie on the map, the fewer similarities do we seem to find. Nevertheless, the two groups of Indo-European languages, whose areas are furthest removed from Celtic, which lie in the opposite pole of the Indo-European expansion, have very singularly affinities with it, the systematic nature of which calls for attention. The kinship of Celtic and Indo-European because, sorry, the kinship of Celtic and Indo-Iranian is shown by a common vocabulary, and this only contains very few words which really count. A few craft terms, if any, the feminine forms of the nouns of number, three and four, and a considerable group of religious or political religious words. In this domain, Italic has much in common with Celtic, and both with Indo-Iranian. Institutions have been even preserved which correspond to its vocabulary or even explain its preservation. Celtic has two words to designate religious belief, Irish, Krabud, and Irish, Iris. There is nothing corresponding to them except in Indo-Iranian, namely Sanskrit and um, Pavlavi, which is parasit or worshipper. Sanskrit, Krada, confidence in the virtues of the offering, as equivalents in Irish credo and Irish cretum. Latin jus, uh, preserved in Irish hus, corresponds to zend yaus, or Sanskrit ya. The word for king is the same in both groups, Sanskrit raj and rajan, Latin rex and Celtic rex. The root meaning drink has kept the same form. To drink sacred liquor is an essential part of worship. Lighting the fire is another, and here too the roots uh, reappear and can be recognised by their nasals. Irish, and in it, to light. Sanskrit, in day, he lights. For milk, a religious drink, Irish contains two words, both of Indo-Iranian kinship, gert, cream, which recalls Sanskrit, gertam, a rancid butter, and su. Sanskrit Sula, pressed. That is the uh, Sama, the root weight is given Bashwe, he caused to prosper, to Sanskrit, the name of the god Faunus to Latin, and that's the, the goddess Unon in Irish. The Latin name Neptanus, which recalls the Irish Necton, one of the secondary names of the sea god Nuada, Nect, has also been connected with Sanskrit Napta and the Irish Tria or Tren, with the Sanskrit name of the god Trita. M. Fendries adds the names of the water gods, the only divine names corresponding in the two groups, those of the rivers Sonian or the Shannon and Sintu, and that of the Danuvius and the Zendanus river. The affinities of the Ilex are uh, now called Tocharian, with Celtic are grammatical like that of Celtic and Italic. It has a medio passive or despondent with verb forms in R. It also has, like Latin and Celtic, a subjunctive in A, taken from a stem belonging to that of the indicative. I've already said that it belongs to the centum group of languages, 
and other analogies of structure have been pointed out. These analogies, which are very much unlike those of Celtic with Indo-Iranian, suggest a relationship, something like that between Celtic and Italic, only blurred by time. The Tocharians lived in the Indian orbit and were fed on Indian thought and literature, and their vocabulary shows the effect. It is the structure of their language which tempts one to seek kindred for them in the West. But are we to suppose that they travelled from Europe to Asia? Prehistoric archaeologists note many traces of migrations from Europe to Asia at dates which do not agree with that can be assigned to the breakup of any Western group to which the Tocharians could have belonged. I am convinced that there were other migrations from Asia to Europe at that very date. I also believe that the discovery of Tocharian, like that of the Hittic inscriptions, compels us to move to the cradle of the Indo-European tongues eastwards, and that they were, to some extent, differentiated before they expanded towards the west. Some little contact with the Greeks or the peoples of those languages were known, save through Greek forms, frequent intercourse with the Baltic Slavs, either by immediate contact in the centre of Europe or through the Ger Germans. Contact on a very wide front on the Germanic side, more or less complete unity with the Italicy at a fairly recent date, broken, however, as we shall see, before the Celts finally moved away to the west. These are the facts which first emerged from a comparative examination of the Celtic languages and the Indo-European tongues of Europe. The region in which these complex relations can have existed almost completely and simultaneously during the time when the Italo-Celtic community was breaking up is near the centre of Europe, probably around about Bohemia. The comparisons which may have been both Celtic and Eastern Eastern branches of Indo-European, Indo-European and Tocharian, open vistas into a more distant past. They forbid us to place the separation of the groups which are geographically furthest from each other too far back and suggest that the point of junction of the neighbouring groups should be shifted eastwards, where I shall try not to locate it exactly. In defining the Celtic peoples by their speech, I base my definition on a factor which holds good for peoples which are completely constituted. However, they may have been formed and whatever elements they may have absorbed, and it is to which I prefer to consider them. The brief comparative study which we have just made is has given us much information with, about the element which has supplied the language, or the bulk of the language, and the very definitive affinities which it uh, presents with the most distant groups of Indo-European leave no doubt that the element was of the same stock as the speakers of these songs. But it is shown from the very first, unfortunately, not in no clear manner, that the composition of Celtic peoples was complex, and that in the differentiation of their languages, may share, a share must be ascribed to the alien tribes to which they absorbed. The ancient Greek and Latin writers, from which we obtain some for information about the Celts, mentioned them in the west of Europe in opposition to two peoples which inhabited large areas. The boundaries of which changed from time to time and which were very problematic, the Iberians and the Rations. And these people themselves evidently stand for many others. The ancients speak of the Iberians as being in the British Isles. Is this because the likeness of the name between the Iberians and people after which Ireland has called the Hibernians? Or is it on account of the great number of dark skinned folk in the west of England which struck Tacticus? In the time of Caesar, the Iberians were spreading very much into Gaul in Aquitania, and other directions they are said to have occupied the whole of Italy and also Sicily in the earliest historic inhabitants, of which the Sisani are supposed to have been the Iberians. In the Iberian Peninsula, which they have long shared with the Ligurians, the Iberians appear to have been so long established that we can hardly take them for anything but be Aborigines. But the problem is quite clearly presented and admits of several solutions. What consists in identifying the Iberians and the Basques, who are supposed to be the inheritors of the language in modern Europe? Although this view has its adherents, it is hardly tenable in the point of view of language and indefensible in the, from the, that of archaeology. The Basques are the remnants of a prehistoric populations confined in the Pyrenees. We have already seen 
that in comparison of Basque with the Celtic tongues lead to nothing. If Iberian were represented by Basque, we should ev evidently learn nothing about the part played by the Iberians in the constitution of the Celtic societies from philology. Next, the Iberians have been connected with the Berbers of North Africa, whose language has already been compared to Basque. Herr Schulten and his Spanish pupils and colleagues, uh, Senor Bosch Kimber among them, have given a scientific form to the solution of the problem. In a series of important works in which they have supplanted these linguistic data by archaeological arguments of great value. In this way, they have reconstructed a very convincing picture of the expansion of the Iberians in Spain. M. Philippon, a pupil of Darbois de Juvenal, has on two occasions put forward another theory based on absolute distinction between the Tartessians and Iberians and the elimination of the Ligurians from the peninsula. According to his view, the Tartessians occupied a large part of Gaul and the Iberians almost the whole part, the whole country at different but fairly recent dates. Both peoples were Indo-Europeans who came from Asia, the former by the way of the sea and Africa, the latter by land and the north. M. Philippon has drawn up that the Iberians a vocabulary which is distinct from the Tartessian. It is based on geographical names and proper nouns in which he finds words which are plainly Celtic, like Gurdus, and others which have been usually assigned to Ligurians, such as Rodanus, the Rhone, Sequana, the Seen, Isara, Isir, Alba, and Albion, and even Albus, Fiel, which is certainly Germanic. His vocabulary, therefore, is very like Celtic and not very different from Ligurian. The, con sorry, the consequence would be that Iberian left place names all over France, and even the names of towns, and also in western Germany to the Elbe, in Britain, and throughout Italy, to say nothing of the traces of their journey from east to west. Unfortunately, M. Philippon supports his ethnological conclusions with no archaeological fact and very little chronology. To my mind, accepting as I do with reservations many of M. Philippon's views and regarding the ethnological testimony of the ancient authors as most important, the only set of archaeological remains which could correspond to the area which may be defined with the aid of those selected data is a series of tombs contained bell-shaped vases adorned with incised bands, or flat objects known as bracers or bowmen's wrist guards, conical buttons and daggers of flint or copper, which are found from Sicily to the north of Italy in Sardinia, in the peninsula from Catalonia to Bacia and the neighbourhood of Lisbon, in France from the Pyrenees and province to Brittany, in the British Isles, in Holland, in the valleys of the Rhine and Danube, in Bohemia and in the Middle Elbe. It's just to these tombs containing bell vases that the Sikian period in which Sicily may correspond. Their area of expansion coincides in part with that of the megalithic monuments, but it is wider. A beery name for the last left us to attach to the civilization of Western Europe, chiefly on the coasts, of which the megalithic monuments are the most distinguished representatives. If this is the case, the Iberian element must have formed a considerable ingredient in the composition of the Celtic peoples. It is therefore possible that in what survives of Celtic, there is some Iberian, but it is difficult to place one's finger on it.